Hello, Bible Way Church, and thanks for joining me on uh, July the 26th for our second Sunday service. Uh, so I do hate that we're not able to have Sunday school, uh, but I'm so appreciative that we have Sunday morning service, Wednesday night service, and uh, this is just a simple uh, Bible lesson to put out there for us on the website. I hope that uh, several of you will see it, and it'll be a blessing to you. I uh, do want us to turn in our Bibles this, this uh, afternoon. Uh, to the book of Acts, the first chapter. We're going to look at some of the words of Christ. Uh, one of the teachings, uh, one of the last teachings he left uh, with the disciples. And uh, we're also going to apply that uh, bit to our own lives today. Uh, before I uh, get into the lesson, I would like to uh, pray for us. Lord, I do thank you for those who are joining today. Lord, I thank you for the folks in our church. Uh, some of them, Lord, we just miss so much. And we understand the circumstances of life uh, uh, just don't uh, allow them to be there. And then, Lord, we just got folks that are just missing. And I don't know what their circumstances are, but, God, I pray that you would just uh, uh, know that uh, they're loved and cared for and, and appreciated. Uh, and we just look forward, Lord, to seeing them again uh, in the church and, and in fellowship and, uh, Lord, and trying to be a blessing one to another. I pray that you'll just take this uh, simple thought this afternoon and uh, amplify it, that it will be a blessing to others. And, uh, Lord, these things we ask in your blessed name. Amen. All right, so as we get into the book of Acts, the uh, first chapter, uh, I wanted to read some of the verses of Christ. And, uh, of course, uh, this is the Acts of the, Apostle, of the Apostles, uh, and we see the, uh, 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 that Christ is coming down to literally his last uh, few physical interactions uh, on, on, on earth interacting with the disciples. Now, Christ has had about three and a half years to train them. And if you think about that, uh, in and of itself, that's really amazing. Uh, so we ask sometimes, how long does it take to build a uh, church, to build a congregation? Uh, how long does it take to do the work that God has called us to do? Well, I'm going to tell you that uh, Christ called uh, 12 ordinary men, uh, including Judas Iscariot, who, uh, who was a betrayer. But he called these men, and he had lots of disciples that followed him. These men were chosen by him, and they were chosen that after he had ascended into heaven, which we're about to see happen, they would carry on the work that he had prepared for them. Of course, later he called others, uh, predominantly uh, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, uh, who gave us most of the New Testament. Uh, but basically in the space of about three and a half years. And I want to say that it didn't all start on day one. Uh, there was the uh, there was the the marriage in in uh, uh, Canaan, and there was the uh, the, the the marriage uh, miracle that was performed, and the the apostles didn't all get uh, an email. They didn't get you know all the disciples weren't called on exactly the same day in exactly the format. They didn't show up and they said, okay, uh, it's Sunday. Let's all go to the synagogue and we're going to meet Jesus, and for three and a half years we're going to follow him. They came at different times. They came at different backgrounds. But in the short span, if you think of it, in about three and a half years, uh, we're going to call that 42 months, uh, which quite frankly is, is about the average uh, car payment uh, length these days. Uh, Jesus was able to take these men from being fishers, uh, fishermen, from being uh, you know uh, 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 tax collectors and what have you, and bring them into an understanding of the Old Testament who he was as the Son of God, and to give them the New Testament, as it were, and the new relationship that God had, had laid out with them. It was amazing how much that he got done, uh, the Son of God, just in that short period of time. So I wanted to say that, that our lesson today is involving times, T-I-M-E-S, which Jesus speaks of. And in the book of Acts, the first chapter, uh, we, we see in the fourth verse, uh, and being assembled together with them, Jesus with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? In verse 7 is our text. It says, uh, and he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So 
looking at this uh, thought in verse 7, it says, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. We begin to think about how God does know the seasons. He does know the times. He doesn't always tell us exactly what's going on. Uh, but uh, he begins to look at this, and, and, and I think it's really important with these uh, amazingly complicated days uh, that we have to, to understand the way we view time and the way that God views time. And when his disciples came to him, I'm not sure, truthfully, I'm not sure they totally recognized that Jesus was going to ascend into heaven. Uh, this was one of the very last interactions he had with them uh, as, as, a, uh, as a collective, as a group. And uh, what would they have asked him had they known it was the last interactions? What they did ask him is, uh, Lord, wilt thou uh, at this time uh, restore the kingdom? Uh, they thought maybe he was going to become an earthly ruler again. That he was going to uh, uh, overthrow Rome uh, because, you know, he had the supernatural capabilities. He could calm the storm. He could feed, uh, uh, you know, the, the thousands. He rose from the dead. He could call people from the dead. They saw his ability to do things. I just wonder, even if at this point, if they recognized uh, the spiritual kingdom that uh, Christ had, had begun to establish uh, based upon his own sacrifice, uh, upon his, his, uh, uh, you know, his fulfilling of the law and his giving uh, of himself freely to all of those who would accept his gift of eternal life. So we think about this. Time is important to people. God certainly recognizes that. And, and uh, you know, we, we sometimes forget, uh, by the way, on our, on our better days, uh, that time is important to people. We, we have a finite uh, amount of it. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't care what age you think you're probably going to live to. Uh, it's probably a two-digit number. Um, my grandmother, if she lives a few more weeks, she will be 98 years old. And I hope to get to see her again. You know, the, the COVID-19 uh, thing, we saw her last in uh, late February, maybe early March. And uh, uh, she's being taken wonderfully care of by the uh, people who run the facility where she's at. And uh, every time I get to talk to her, she talks about Jesus, which is good. She doesn't talk really about the places that she used to work or what have you. Her mind has become very, uh, very narrow uh, in the things that she recalls and the things she wants to interact with. But God and her understanding of Scripture and what have you, it's, it's at the forefront of that. But my grandmother's 98 years old, and she's not likely to have another 98 years to live. You know, her, her, her lifespan is, is uh, you know, is finite, just as mine is. Uh, I don't know that I'll live to be 98 years old. Uh, there's days I kind of wonder if I'll live to be 59 years old. Uh, but time is important to people. We really never have enough of it, and I think it's in the circumstances of life where we begin to recognize that when life becomes so precious to us. Uh, if you've ever been in a life-threatening circumstance, uh, and I'm, I used to travel a lot, you've been on an airplane uh, that's in a lightning storm, and you realize that they don't pull those things over to the curb and park. You have to go through that storm, and uh, you're re recognizing what could happen during that. Uh, I've got a, a dear friend who, uh, you know, has a, um, you know, has a, 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 an illness that has uh, changed his life, his family's life incredibly. And you begin to look at that. And when you come to that, where you recognize getting up in the morning and having one more day on this earth is a great blessing, you begin to understand how finite time is. Now, when you're really, really young, when you're really, really healthy, when things are really, really, really good, that may not be just as uh, self-evident to you as, as when they're not. But the fact is, life is quickly passing for most of us. Uh, we get up in the morning, uh, we plan our day, you know, we, we, we have a list, we've got a post-it note that says we're going to do this and do this, and, and we do this, and we try to work our way down the list perhaps, and uh, maybe it's a Saturday, and, uh, and, and your to-do list doesn't have really anything on it except go to the park and have a picnic and have fun. You know, play Frisbee with the dogs. Uh, you, you know, take, take the family for a walk. Go get ice cream. Uh, whatever those things are. But regardless, our days are passing very, very quickly. And through the years of the ministry, I can remember the people who talked to me about the years that were wasted. What that means is they came to the point in life where windows had closed, opportunities had passed by, and they recognized that the choices they had made the values they had placed were uh, were not the best place they could have put put their values, uh, the best way they could have made use of their time. 
But Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and uh, they're asking about, of course, the kingdom. Uh, are you going to restore it at this time? And and and, uh, and Jesus responds, yes, first to the kingdom. It is not for you to know the sea, the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. God holds the ability to uh, build up kingdoms, to tear down kingdoms, to uh, change a person's life. There, you know, you look at the people in the Word of God that God chose them. He called Moses when he was on the backside of the uh, of the desert. He was 80 years old. But the work that God had chosen to do in Moses' life started at his birth. And when his mother put him in the, uh, you know, in the, in the little uh, basket of reeds and put him down there, and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter and was given, you know, a world-class education and all this. God had worked through his life that entire time, that entire cycle. He had something special in mind for those last 40 years. God, uh, you know, and Moses didn't see it until he found the burning bush. God began to speak to him. God does hold in his power the ability to set in motion certain things, to allow certain things to happen. I believe in the individual's life, in the world that's around us. Uh, I've been doing a study, uh, again, uh, you know, in the world that was after the Great Flood uh, with uh, Nimrod and uh, uh, Babylon and what was going on there uh, and how God uh, looked at the world at that point. And, and he chose to change the season that those people had planned for them. He allowed them to do certain things and be successful in it, but he wouldn't tolerate it after a certain point. And even uh, we go back before that to the Great Flood, and we understand that uh, there was a day, as, as outlined in the uh, book of Genesis, the sixth chapter, that everything that God saw upon the face of the earth, outside of Noah and his family, was evil. Evil continued. Every imagination of the heart was bad, 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 bad. And uh, God suffered that for a short period of time, uh, and then he made a, an escape. He made an offer. Uh, I think it's amazing to show the goodness and the grace of God that when Noah had completed the construction of the ark, the Bible says yet seven days. God told him, okay, you're there. The ark's finished. I'm, gonna, I'm going to bring about uh, destruction. I'm going to take out the known world. Could you imagine the zeal that Noah, his wife, his family had as they went out into the community and said, look, we got seven days and then God is going to destroy this. And we got six days and we got five days. And I believe that every day Noah would have went to his family, to the marketplace, to the people that were around him and said, there's still time. And then there was no more time because God had, had held that back. Well, folks, I can tell you, according to the word of God, and listen, I'm a Bible believer. Uh, I don't hide from that. Uh, it is my identity is to be hidden in Christ, to believe God's word, to take it uh, from cover to cover. Uh, now, sure, there's parts of it I don't completely understand. Uh, there's one day that I can ask Jesus. Uh, one day I can ask the people who wrote these things down. And, 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 and there are things that are not written down in the Bible that will become self-evident to us once we're in the presence of God. But I don't back away from the fact that I love Christ. He changed my life 40 years ago. Uh, I love his word. I believe it is the foundation for the Christian life is, is a prayer, uh, a personal relationship with God where you acknowledge him as your savior. Uh, ask him to, be, to come into your heart after you acknowledge yourself as a sinner and that Christ is our savior and to go forward with that. And you begin to look at God's understanding of the seasons and the fact that he views time differently than we do. Now, if you have your uh, Bible still open, I want you to go to the very, very first man, the very first uh, scripture that we find, which is in the book of uh, Genesis. And we're going to look at two references to early time with Adam. Uh, the first is, uh, before he had sinned, uh, he was still in the garden. He was alone. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he was uh, doing the things that God had created him to do. And God spoke to him in the book of Genesis, the second chapter. I hope you've turned there. And uh, God gave him a rule. And uh, we, we look at verse 16 of the uh, second chapter. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Now remember, Adam is still perfect. He, he, he has no sin that's come into his life. God is giving him one rule. And by the way, one rule is probably uh, more than most of us could keep as well as Adam. So let's not throw rocks at Adam. Uh, most of us don't do nearly as well as Adam did. Uh, but, but in verse 17, it says, which thou uh, shalt not eat of, uh, uh, of it. And look at this, for in the day 
in the day, D-A-Y, in the day, time, in the day, in the time that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we see two things, uh, you know, promoted here. One is God's understanding of time as he related it to Adam. And uh, by the way, time is evidenced in the beginning of this, and it's not time as we understand it. Uh, it says that God spoke, uh, things were created, you know, uh, the universe was created, uh, all the things that we understand that were created, uh, light was separated from dark, water from dry land. Uh, you say, Steve, how can that be? I don't know. I don't have that kind of power. And listen, let's be honest. Most of us, when we speak with our voice to our pets, you know, those little critters that live in the backyard that we feed them and we groom them and uh, we look after them, we give them water and we, we play Frisbee with them, what have you, they don't respond to our voice very well. And we take good, pretty good care of them. We should probably be able to understand that a long time before we understand the power of God, that he could separate the, uh, the dry land from the wet sea. But in six days, he created, and yeah, I don't back up from that. I'm a, I'm a creationist. I believe the world was created in six days. Uh, I've heard several people, I know that they believe in uh, evolution and, and they believe in uh, some kind of hybrid system and what have you. Don't buy into that at all. And in fact, I think that the, uh, the fact that math and science can be apl applied to the universe around us and, and the fact that physics works and, and uh, you know, and, and we can study chemistry and those type of things, it demonstrates divine order. It, de it demonstrates divine creation. And uh, so, yeah, I believe the world was created in six days and I'll go to the grave believing that. You won't convince me otherwise. But in those six days, God created everything, including Adam. He gave Adam one rule. And what did he tell him? He said, in the day, in that time frame, and you know, that, that you do this, the season that you now have will end. You will bring that season, that time to a close if you take this action. And the second thing we see here is not just the season, but also the consequence. Therefore, thou shalt surely die. Now, now I believe that Adam was created uh, not only in the, uh, in the uh, image of God, but I believe that Adam was created without the self-destruct mechanism that we have in our body called aging. And, uh, uh, you know, some people, they age differently, some better. Some don't age at all, and it doesn't seem fair. Uh, but, uh, you know, some, they, they, uh, they, they look older when they're younger, and some look uh, yet much younger when they're older. doesn't seem like it's really fair that way. But I believe that when Adam was created, he did not have within his DNA sequence necessarily the curse of aging, the curse of life. And uh, we could probably debate that. That would be a really good debate, right? Um, let's look at the 17th verse of the third chapter. So we read the 17th verse of the second chapter. And uh, here we see that sin has come in. Uh, Eve has sinned. Adam has followed. Uh, she was deceived. He chose willingly. And in uh, the third chapter of Genesis, the 17th chapter, it says, and, Adam, uh, and, and unto Adam he, God said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the fruit, the one rule he had, he broke it, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Here are the consequences. And in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So I believe that Adam's life is now become numbered. And he goes on in the 18th verse and says, Thorns also and thistles shall, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb uh, uh, shalt eat the herb of the field. And look at verse 19. This is where I was getting to. It says, In the sweat of the face uh, of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou uh, it was uh, uh, thou taken for dust uh, thou art, and un unto dust thou shalt return. And I personally believe that God, who is able, changed the DNA sequence, whatever you want to call it, of both Adam and Eve at this point in time. God spoke about the things that would happen to Eve and her body. Uh, he speaks to Adam at this point uh, about uh, returning to, to, to dust. And, and they changed, as it were, their seasons. Uh, they changed the, the context, I think, that God had for them when he created them in perfection. Now, you start to look at that and uh, you say, well, is that really uh, possible? Let me ask you this, and, and, and dead serious. We, we have a great prayer study, Bible study on Wednesday night. And we come together as uh, the people of God, people of faith, 
And, and there's a lot of folks who aren't part of our church, and, and quite frankly, they, they may not be Christians. Uh, they may not have any faith at all, certainly nothing they practice. And we, we, we take a lot of time. Okay, who has a prayer request? Would you pray for this? How many times each and every week, each and every day for that matter, do we pray for God to take some level of intervention in the physical well-being of a person? You know, Lord, would you intervene in this? Uh, I'm familiar with a situation uh, a couple of weeks ago. A young lady had something that, that was going on. Uh, they went and got medical attention. Did not look like the, the uh, uh, issue was immediately resolved. There were a whole bunch of people that said, God, would you intervene on that young lady's behalf, on that, on that wonderful family's behalf? Would you touch them? What are we asking God to do? We're not asking him to part the Red Sea. We're not asking him to build an ark. We're asking him to do something physically within that body, which helps it to heal. Maybe that means, uh, you know, a surgeon's involved, or, uh, you know, I've got a dear friend who takes, uh, uh, you know, uh, different types of, of uh, uh, remedies, uh, you know, chemistry, uh, uh, you know, medicines, that type of thing to, to heal their body. But we're asking God to intervene in some way. And sometimes we pray for a miracle. God, you're the only one that can do this. Uh, you're the only one that can heal this situation. We're asking him to look into the makeup of that body. So why wouldn't we think that God could intervene in the, his, in the, uh, in the circumstances of Adam uh, and Eve and change the nature of their body so that they are now prepared for the next cycle, by the way, which is a worse cycle. So we think about the idea of God understanding seasons differently. I think he understands the physical seasons of our life, and I think he understands the spiritual seasons of our life. And, and by the way, we could say financial uh, seasons. There's times in life where you may make more money or less money. Uh, I'll leave that aside. But the two that really matter to us are spiritual and physical. We had a man in our church who spoke recently about a dear friend of his that was 95 years old who had come to the point where he had asked Christ to come into his heart and asked him to forgive him. Uh, and, and he, this 95-year-old like my 98-year-old grandmother, has to have some appreciation of, of time and, and uh, the season and where they're at in the season of life. But listen, I don't care if you're 16. Now, the, I know there's a young man that I pray for often. Uh, I don't care, you know, if, if, if you're in your late teens or if you're in your 30s. We had a, a man that was 32 years old today who testified what God, about what God has just done in his life. You need to come spiritually to the point where God brings you to that season that when he calls upon you and you realize that you are a sinner, that the things you've done in your life make you, uh, you're going to be held responsible and they make you um, uh, unworthy in any situation to enter into heaven. You've got to call upon God and ask him to save you. When you come to that spiritual season, you have got to accept that. And you have to understand that even in your, in your spiritual life, you're going to have better days and worse days. In fact, uh, I'm going to get a graph for, for you. Let me grab this off the printer. And, um, uh, and I, I wanted to share this with you. I, I've used this a lot in life. I learned this a long time ago. I don't think I've ever used it in a, uh, a Bible message, but I'm going to. So I'm going to hold this up. And uh, this is a bell-shaped curve. And a bell-shaped curve is often used in uh, different things to... Uh, kind of demonstrate how things are working. And uh, typically you'll have about 80 or 90% of what's typical, which is under the, the bell-shaped curve. Then you have a portion of it which is uh, better to best and, and worse to worst. And when you think about this bell-shaped curve, and you think about our spiritual life, there was a day you got saved. And I'm going to call it best day ever. So let me put my chart back up here and I'll hold it to the side. You know, best day ever. Uh, this man spoke about it this morning, that your sins are forgiven. Uh, you know that you have new life. Uh, the Word of God just begins to open up to you. Uh, you know, the, the, the flood of tears may come. Uh, there's a lot of emotions involved with that. And then, you know, there are days where maybe you've greatly transgressed against God or, or worse day, uh, someone that you had great confidence in uh, failed you. And maybe they didn't just fail you, they failed you miserably. Uh, they failed everybody. It was someone you had confidence in, in, in the ministry and uh, and, and then you found out they, uh, they, they were, uh, you know, they embezzled something and they ran off to a place and uh, they shouldn't have been or uh, they were, they were uh, you know, they, they just failed in some 
huge consequence. Spiritually, most of us are going to live about 80 to 90 percent of our life in the middle of that bell-shaped curve. We're going to worship God. We're going to read our Bible. We're going to pray. We're going to try to witness. We're going to try to be the things that God has called us to be. That's the spiritual season that that uh, you know that we're set up to to uh, to look at. And by the way, I think spiritually, physically, if you look at this, most of us we're about 90. 90 percent let me get this again here uh about 90 percent of our days are going to be typical days right here under this then we're going to have uh maybe eight percent that are better or worse on either end you're going to have two percent that's best and and uh and worst and uh by the way there's a physical aspect of this uh you know your your uh, your family uh, the day that you get married best day ever the day that you have a, a child a grandchild born to you best day ever you know, and, and then worse, uh, you, you get a bad, uh, uh, you know, uh, physical injury. You get uh, this this terrible thing. Uh, your 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 company that you've worked for so diligently and been such a, an important part of your life. Uh, you know, they uh, they have difficulties. They start letting people off. Maybe they go bankrupt. Better and worse, but about ninety percent of what we do is going to be in this season, in this time that God gives us, where things are pretty normal. And we need to take advantage of that. Why? Because on this bell-shaped curve, that 90% is where we're going to get a lot of things done. Uh, it's uh, where a lot of things uh, are, are going to happen. Now, the disciples at this point with Jesus, th they said, Lord, you know, uh, they, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom uh, to Israel? When these men were looking at that, where were they on this curve? Well, Let's go back to Peter. You know, worst day ever. Peter denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the disciples turned and they hit, the, turned and hid from him. Right? He went to the cross at Calvary. They came to the cross. Uh, I'm sorry to to the uh, to the borrowed tomb uh, on the third day. You know, looking for Jesus to still be there. Guess what? The tomb was empty. It had been rolled away. Best day ever. Christ has risen. And, and when they were looking at this, uh, at this uh, aspect of would you restore the kingdom again, I think we see Christians today turning to God and saying, God, are you going to fix all this, please? Can we fix this today? I don't like what's going on in the world around us today. I want to be back on the better side. I want to be back on typical. In fact, if we go back about six months, I really like what we were doing six months ago better than where we're at today. But sometimes that season changes. And these men were asking Jesus to push them towards the best and the better side of this curve. Do we ever pray that? God, there's somebody that doesn't like me. There's somebody in the office and they persecute me. I've got a neighbor that just, you know, they, they uh, uh, every time I go to church, they look at me and snicker and it bothers me. Could you make that go away? Maybe that's not in the 90% that's typical. Maybe that's in the worst section. And if you're if you're persecuted, uh, like we remember remember ISIS, we used to see the ISIS people. They they would uh, you know the terrorists that they were, thugs that they were. They they they'd put the Christians in the orange jumpsuits and behead them. That's 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 definitely on the worst uh, side of that. You know, I mean, but they died for the cause of Christ. They, they, according to the Word of God, they went on to heaven. They received a great reward for dying in their faith. And by the way, this isn't, this isn't uh, part of this lesson, but I'm going to stop here for a second. If you keep up with the news, and when I say news, I'm not talking about all of this uh, airtime stuff they put on there that's just one person ranting over something and what have you. News is news. News is facts and what have you. If you keep up with the news, you are beginning to see people in unusual places, unusual circumstances, becoming that candle in the darkness that Jesus spoke about that light in, in the uh, you know that light that, that's that's uh, put on a hill that people can see it in the darkness of the world around us when people reject the gospel reject Christ they go towards everything that's not Christ and you see people begin to stand and saying I will bow a knee to Jesus only I will not you know, get into all this other stuff. I will live my life according to the Word of God and the precepts that He's given to His uh, to His children. And by the way, there's three things. You know, there's there's preferences. You hear me say this all the time. Forgive me for saying it again. Preferences, 
principles and precepts. Preferences, you like pistachio ice cream, I like uh, vanilla ice cream, somebody else likes strawberry. It's not going to really matter in the kingdom of God. I think we'll have all there, uh, you, know, if, 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 you know, if that's what we want. It doesn't really matter. It's very individualist. A principle is a guiding, is a, is a guiding uh, doctrine uh, that is based upon, you know, uh, the foundation of God's word. Uh, but there's also an element of there of flexibility, as it were. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can you can violate a principle, and uh, and it's more a matter of uh, preference uh, or or you know choice than it is anything else. But here's the thing: when we get to precepts, precepts are based upon the Word of God. There is one God. He exists in three persons: the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Uh, Jesus is the only Son of God. He was born of a virgin. Uh, he lived a sinless life, never never committed any sin of any type. He went to the cross at Calvary. He died. He was persecuted and tormented and tortured for our sins. And through the shedding of his blood, which was perfect, we can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And by the way, the, the eternal life, there's another aspect of, of a season, right? God identifies so much with time. Jesus himself said he was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, God understands time in our life. And and, and we, we think about the time that we're in, the season that we're in, and God is calling us. You know, we're, we're really kind of, again, in that 90% under the bell-shaped curve, 90% of our life is to be the typical things we're typically called to do. We're not necessarily in the 8% on either side or the 2% on either end. These are the typical days. God's just changing the seasons of the world around us. I'm very thankful. I'm very appreciative. I'm uh, prayerful for the people who are, you know, quote, making the news, whether it's local or the gossip circuit or Facebook or what have you, because in this season when the world is in turmoil, they're choosing to stand upon faith, a faith that brings them peace, a faith that is wrought in uh, understanding who God is and who we're not, a faith that says God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, He's going to take care of, of, of my bills. He's going to, you know, he's going to meet my needs. Uh, and one day this season for us of, of, of uh, you know, a physical time will end just like it did for Adam. Uh, this, uh, maybe you're in a spiritual warfare right now. You just, you just struggle every day. You're saying that there'll be an end to that, that better days will come. Uh, and uh, maybe we'll look back towards the best day, the best days of our life spiritually whatever those may be. Uh, coming to Christ certainly has got to be at the top of that list. And, uh, and if you've never come to Christ, uh, what is your spirituality uh, based upon? Is it good works? Uh, they're going to fail you. Is it your own self-righteousness? Jesus called out the Pharisees on that. And we're nowhere near as good as the Pharisees were at keeping the law. So why don't we build our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? These men came to Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus do something immediate in that, in that time. But, season, uh, but Jesus came out, and uh, he said in uh, Acts verse 7, he said, Hey, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, what he had told them previously, that maybe they didn't put it all together just yet, but they would in a short period of time, is they were beginning to look at a season of persecution. He'd spent three and a half years, as I said, training them for, from the beginning, you know, from the first one to, to, you know, some of them, maybe it was a little less time. Uh, Paul was called after the fact. He spent three years of his own time, you know, out, out in the desert studying the scriptures. Maybe that wasn't a full three years. Maybe it was a season here and, and what have you. We can ask him one day, but Paul himself said he spent three years in the desert studying the scripture. God had brought them to that place where a new season was coming. The time of their learning was now pretty much behind him. Jesus was going back to heaven. He was not going to overthrow Rome. And by the way, some of the things that we're in the world around today, we say, wow, wow, we, you know, we wish that God would address that. He's not necessarily going to. What is it Jesus said? Uh, which, which the Father hath put in his own power. The darker it gets, the greater the testimony of love and sacrifice and discipleship and fellowship with Christ and salvation shines in a dark world around us today. 
When we begin to look at this mystery that God has kept in his hands, here we, of course, in the scripture can apply it to the kingdom that they were looking for. But for some 2,000 years, we've seen the seasons change. Times of persecution, times of, of religious endorsement, time of revival, you know, times when uh, the world was falling away, falling apart, uh, global wars, times of great prosperity. God has been God through all of that. There was a day I read to you when Adam chose in his heart to not follow God anymore. God was still God on that day. Adam sinned. Adam hid from God in the Garden of Eden. The season changed in that situation for Adam because of the choices that he had made. Folks, I would encourage you to think about the seasons of your life. If you have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, He stands at the door and He knocks for you. The Bible tells us that uh, that day when He convicts you of your sins, you understand the uh, Scriptures and how it applies personally to your life. You have the option on that day to change the season of your life. As I said, Jesus identified himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And when you talk about what is the gift of God, it is the gift of eternal life. Life is something that we all treasure and appreciate and, and value and want more of. And God gave the uh, descriptive term of eternity, forever. There's no question, according to the Word of God, that when we lay down this body of flesh that we have at whatever time that is, and it'll come sooner than any of us expect, we go on into a place of eternity. Only two options. Two options. There's no third choice. Either we go to this place that God created for the devils when they rebelled uh, against him, the devil and his third of the angels, this place called hell, and terrible place of torment it is. Uh, the recordings that uh, we have of that place, uh, it's uh, terrible, wicked. Uh, the people that are there, they're, they're there forever. Uh, they want out. The, the simplest of joys that we might have uh, they can't even begin to imagine a, a single drop of water uh, would be a treasure to them. If you miss the season of your life to accept Christ as your Savior, that's the place you go. It's not because God's mean or hateful or what have you. He's just got no other place for you. Because the area of heaven is an area of perfection. The first rebels there ever were was the devil and that third of the angels. And he, he, he put them out. We can't go there as humans with sin in our life. The reason that you would go to heaven is not because you're a great person, because you gave lots of money to the church, uh, because you attend faithfully every time the doors open and your grandparents were the charter members of the church of everything that's important. You go there because Jesus paid for our sins upon the cross at Calvary with every drop of blood that he shed. The greatest season that we can have in life, I'm going to go back to my uh, bell-shaped curve here, is the one that begins on that best day where we begin to serve Christ and we accept Him as our Savior. And uh, most of our days are going to be here. Sure, there's going to be days when there's trouble in our life and uh, spiritually or physically or financially, and maybe there's worse days. I know so many people that have lost a dear loved one, lost a child, uh, lost a spouse. Uh, they lost everything that was truly important to them in one short period of time. They suffered, but God didn't leave them there. And they were able to recover according to His grace. Folks, I would tell you the seasons of life. These disciples, they looked at Jesus. I don't think they really understood, truthfully, that He was going to just ascend, you know, with their vision above that. They might have asked Him some different questions uh, or had a different conversation. But Jesus said, The Father hath put in His own power, uh, knowing the times and the seasons, he said, but you shall receive uh, power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. There was a new season coming. The times were getting ready to change. And these men, with their uh, message and the power of the Holy Spirit upon their life, they were getting ready to go and change the world around them. How amazing that is. God has called us to live in this amazing time that we live, good or bad. You know, that 90% typical, that's where we live today. People are going to reject the gospel. People are going to embrace the gospel. Got a good friend, Brother uh, Coulter uh, Patterson. He's a wonderful young preacher and just getting his uh, ministry going. 
Uh, Brother Coulter says it sure is easy to get people to take a track these days. It's a good time to talk with people about what God has done in our life. Jesus is coming again. When he comes, by the way, this uh, next time, he's not going to touch down on the earth. He's going to take his church out, the rapture of the church, and the season that is here on the earth will change instantly and in a scale that people have never begun to imagine for the worst. Uh, then, then there is no better. You know, there's, there's worse and worse and worse and worse uh, in that when Jesus comes. Folks, I would encourage you, if you're watching this, to realize what God's doing in your life, to accept the season, to embrace the things that he's brought into your life. And, and uh, in that 90%, uh, you know, maybe it's not best or worst or, 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 or better or, or, or uh, uh, worse or worst or what have you. Live in the moment. Live in the day. Ask God to do something with your life. Uh, and, and really, if you've got a great sense of adventure, uh, ask God to do something unexpected in your life, unexpectedly wonderful in your life. Um, there's a there's a particular uh, car place I go to, and they do some service work on my vehicle. Wonderful people there. If you ever need somebody to do good car car work, I I can tell you where to find them. And uh, they've got a small little waiting area. Now COVID 19s kind of changed a bit of that, you know, because you can't get too, you know, it's a six foot rule and masks and all that. But uh, I've had some great conversations about church, about Christ, setting that little waiting room. Could we be courageous enough to ask God to do something unexpected in our life? We're going to live in that bell-shaped 90% moment. God, would you open a door that uh, perhaps we could do something with the time that you've given us in this immediate engagement? Uh, you know, I had a, an unexpected uh, circumstance that happened to me in October. But by the way, uh, in uh, probably April or May of 2019, man, I had it all planned out. I did. I was going to do this, and I was going to do this, and, and this door was open for me. And I thought, wow, I'll just go do these things. Uh, let me tell you what, most of it didn't work out. And uh, I'm thankful now for the way I didn't enjoy all of it, but I'm thankful for the doors that God did open. I got to meet some wonderful people. Got to talk with them about the things that mattered to Christ. Uh, now, I wasn't praying. I'm not that adventurous. I wasn't praying, hey, God, take my life and do something incredibly unexpected. Put me on crutches. Put me in a place I've never never wanted to go. <laughs> Introduce me to people that, that are going to help me by hurting me. <laughs> uh, I mean that, of course, in, in great love. The people who helped me, uh, they made me push myself to, to, to uh, do certain things. But God can use our life in unexpected ways if we'll just man up, uh, woman up, and say, God, uh, take me. And at the season I'm at, the physical place I'm at, the, the spiritual place I'm at, the financial place I'm at, in the world around me, let's do something good for Christ. These men, these disciples, they looked at Jesus. Jesus was getting ready to leave them in a place where within just a short period of time, they would be outcasts and persecuted. Uh, they enjoyed preaching in Jerusalem until the persecution started, and then they scattered everywhere. And by the way, Saul chased them everywhere. And um, not sure that they saw that coming. I thought they, uh, maybe they thought it would be a little more simple than that. Hey, church, I'm going to finish up with that thought of, uh, you know, the seasons of life, the times, uh, T-I-M-E-S, from Acts uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 7. God looks at time differently than we do, but we should embrace the season and the times that God has placed us in, become his faithful servant. And uh, these things we, we, we thank God for in his blessed name. I hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. If, you, if you're seeing this, thank you for tuning in. It went 44 minutes, so longer than I'd expected. I look forward to seeing every one of you again soon in a church service. And uh, may God be with you and your family. And, Bless you richly. Amen.